Okay, it's time to begin our morning service. If you're visiting with us, thank you. You're our honored guest, and we hope you come back and see us again. Also, take the time to fill out a visitor's card. You can leave it on the pew or place it in the collection tray. And if you have a cell phone or any other electronic device, can you silence that at this time so it don't, don't become a distraction during service? Steve and Teresa Tatum have requested prayers for multiple health problems. And please see our bulletin for a list of shut-ins or those with ongoing health issues. We are participating in a commodity drive for the Tennessee Children's Home through May 22nd. A list of needed, needed items is posted on the bulletin in the foyer, on the bulletin board in the foyer. The next term for the Chattanooga School of Preaching and Biblical Studies starts here tomorrow at 7 p.m. Everyone is welcome to come. Vacation Bible School is scheduled for Saturday, June 18th. And to, this morning after classes, there will be a teacher's meeting for the VBS, and you'll meet down front of the auditorium here. And first prayer today will be Mark Lewis. Closing prayer will be Josh Gilbride. Scripture reading will be Alex Clark and Micah Perry. And Bob Garrett will be leading us in song. going to start with number 397. 397. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he given how beautiful heaven must be how beautiful heaven must be sweet home of the happy and free
mouth. Our most righteous Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy love and kindness. We're most grateful for Jesus Christ, Thy Son, the ultimate sacrifice, who gave His life that we may have eternal life with Thee. Dear Lord, at this time, we ask that You be with those who are sick. We ask You be with Teresa and Steve Tatum, comfort them, help them be restored back to their wanted place in life. I ask that You be with those that are long-term illnesses and shut-ins and others that are members of the church. Help us to be good stewards and reach out to them and give them encouragement. Dear Lord, at this time, we ask that you give peace to the world. Help those that are in Ukraine to have faith and courage. Help us to do what we need to do to support them. At this time, dear Lord, we ask that you help us to clear our minds and open it to thee, that we may learn thy word and study it and take it to bring others to thee in Christ's name. Amen. Number 393, 393. Scripture reading will be from the book of John, the book of John, chapter 20, and we will start with verse 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Let us pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the scriptures that we can read about the crucifixion and what it means to us as, as Christians. We pray this morning that uh, we partake of this bread that represents his body upon the cross for us, that we can do so in a manner that be pleasing in thy sight and help us, Heavenly Father, to do uh, the things that we need to do according to thy will. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us pray. Dear Father, at this time we offer our thanks for this fruit of the vine. We're thankful for the blood that was shed on the cross on our behalf as we endeavor to partake of this in that memory. We pray that we do it in a pleasing manner. In Christ's name, amen. Scripture reading before the giving will be from the book of John. The book of John in chapter 21. 
The book of John, chapter 21, starting in verse 15. John 21, starting in verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he saith unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus unto, saith unto him, Feed my sheep. <clears throat> Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we live in this great country. We know that you have blessed us beyond means. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we think about these things, that we can return a portion of that back, that the elders and the ones that spend the monies here can do so wisely and spread thy kingdom in this area and through the world. We're thankful again for all the blessings you give us. Help us to give with an open and a glad heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go to mark number 125, 125, that will be our song of exhortation. Before the lesson, good old 47.
If you have a Bible with you this morning, let's go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 18. As Brother Rodney mentioned in the announcements this morning, tomorrow night will be the first session of our new classes in the uh, Chattanooga School of Preaching, Biblical Studies. At 9 o'clock, we'll be finishing up the life of Christ, which we started last term. At 8 o'clock, we'll be having a session on personal evangelism. And at 7 o'clock, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in Jude, if you have an opportunity, come and enjoy the camaraderie, camaraderie and enjoy the study together. I want to go with you this morning to ancient Greece, to a city by the name of Corinth. Now, some of us have been to a Corinth, but not that one. Corinth was known in ancient times as being a place of idolatry and as a place of immorality. But when the Apostle Paul went there and preached the good news of salvation through Jesus, great things happened. When Paul left that city after having been there for over a year and a half, a congregation of God's people existed. And later, Paul wrote letters to the church in Corinth, but in our study this morning, we want to focus in on the original conversions. And so our study this morning from Acts 18, verses 1 through 11, is going to be a look at conversions in Corinth when Paul initially went there and preached the gospel. And as we work through the text this morning, you, you can look at these three main points that we're going to consider. We're going to consider the messenger. Well, we know who that was. But we're going to see how the messenger conducted himself. Number two, we're going to look at the message. And then finally, number three, we're going to look at the response if you want to put an S on the end of that, the responses that people had to the gospel when it was preached there. I want to begin in verse 1 and read down through verse number 11. Acts 18, beginning in verse number 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Verse 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshiped God whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And, Cri and Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So Paul arrived in this city of immorality and idolatry, and his efforts made a difference. When he left that city, there were many who were followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, how did that work? What was the role of the messenger? And just what was the message that he proclaimed there? And how did people respond 
to that message. Well, that's the approach we're taking to our study this morning. Well, the messenger is identified there in verse number one as being Paul. Now, as we study the book of Acts, we often look at Paul's activities and his efforts to preach the gospel in various places, and we often divide those into distinct preaching trips or preaching journeys. If you're of that mindset, this would be the second recorded preaching trip of Paul. So when you look at this man, Paul, here's a person who went from a great persecutor of the church to a propagator of the gospel. He went from an opposer of Jesus of Nazareth to being one who proclaimed Jesus to anyone who would listen. And here's the only place in the Bible, I believe, verse number three, where we're given the information that in terms of his trade, Paul was a tent maker. And so he hooks up with this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, and they work together. But beginning in verse number four then, we read about his work as a messenger. We're going to read about him reasoning, persuading, and teaching. And that's the language there in verse four, the reasoning part. And he reasoned. The word reason is from a Greek word, dialegami. When you say that quickly, it sounds kind of like an English word, dialegami, dialogue. And so it's a thought of reasoning in the mind and then having a discourse, sometimes it could be an argument, a discussion with people. That's what Paul was doing. In order to reach out to people, he appealed to their intellect. You know, the Bible says in the Old Testament, God's message to, to his people was, come and let us reason Together, Isaiah 1 and verse 18, that's the approach that Paul took. And the Bible says in verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue. Now, why would a man who used to be a follower of the Jewish religion still go to a place where the followers of the Jewish religion congregate? He would go there because he would find prospects. People who already believed in the God of heaven is a one true God. People who already believed in the message of the Old Testament. People who believed the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. People who had the habit of worshiping God. They simply did not realize or to that point were unwilling to accept the reality that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the promised Messiah. And so he reasoned with them every Sabbath. And then the Bible says in verse number four that he persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. How, well, how did he persuade? By, by using the, the word of God. It, it, again, was an appeal to the intellect, but, but Paul was not a robot. He, he, connect, he tried to connect with people and tried to persuade them. He, he did not try to trick them. He did not pay them with material resources to get them to come into the kingdom, but he would use the word of God to try and persuade them. Look in your Bible back in chapter 17. We read a moment ago in verse 4 that he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews. Now here was Paul's approach. Paul would go into a community and if there was a sufficient uh, population in the Jewish community, there would be a synagogue, and to the synagogue he would go. Well, what would be his approach? You say, well, he reasoned with them. How did he reason? Look in your Bible in chapter 17. This is another city, but a similar approach. Acts 17, he's in Thessalonica, verse number two, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them, and then here's some additional information. How? out of the scriptures. Well, which portion of the scriptures would that be? That would be the Old Testament. So Paul, as a Jew, standing before fellow Jews, individuals who believed in the Old Testament promises of the coming Messiah, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures, verse three, 
opening and alleging or proving that Christ must needs have suffered and men and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And so that was Paul's approach. Go into the Jewish community, use the Jewish scriptures, that is the scriptures the Jews followed, and from that say, here's what the scripture said about the coming Messiah, and look at how that played out in the life of Jesus. So he reasoned with them. It was an appeal to their intellect. You know, Jesus said that no man can come to him unless the Father who sent him draws that person. That's interesting, isn't it? John 6, 44. No human can come to Jesus for salvation unless the Father who sent Jesus draws that person to Jesus. And it makes a person wonder, well, how does God accomplish that? How does God work to draw or attract or pull or lead people to Jesus? Well, if you went on and read in verse number 45 of John 6, you would see that those who have learned and been taught by God, they're the ones that come to Jesus. And so the process that God used to to get human beings to become followers of his son is he uses the scriptures. And in this case, Paul was the messenger through whom God got the message to the people of Corinth. And notice in verse number five, he reached out. I'm sorry, verse four. He persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now we mentioned earlier, here's Paul's habit that we see in the book of Acts. When he went into a new community, if there was a a Jewish population that gathered in the synagogues, he would go to them. In fact, when he went to Philippi, He went out and found Jewish people along along the river, but he did not turn a blind eye to the Gentiles because according to verse number four, he was reaching out to the Jews and to the Greeks. Now, why would he do that? Because the gospel is the power of God to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to whom? To the Greeks. Romans chapter one and verse 16. And so God's message, the gospel, is for all people in all places. And so as we go out into our communities and we're looking for prospects, we're not looking for someone of a certain biological ancestry. We're not looking for someone from a certain nationality. We're not looking for someone with a specific skin color. We're looking for someone. (laughs) We're looking for any human who's made in the image of God. And that's what Paul was doing. He was reaching out to the Jews and also to the Greeks. And as we've noticed there in verse five, he was was proclaiming to them that Jesus was the Christ. Jesus was a common male name among the Jews. In addition to Jesus of Nazareth, there are at least two other characters who are mentioned in the Bible by the name of Jesus. But there was only one Christ. Jesus was not a Christ. He was not one of the Christ. He was the single Christ. Look down further in chapter 18. In fact, it's the last verse. And here the message is about Apollos. It says, he mightily convinced the Jews in that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. I think the New King James, Jesus is the Christ. And so that's the approach that Apollos and and other messengers did as well. Now, what happened when Paul presented the gospel? Did everyone receive that message with open arms? And the answer is no. Look at verse number six. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your bud be upon your heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go into the Gentiles. Paul recognized that his role was to be a communicator. Okay? He was a reasoner and a persuader, a communicator. But he could not jump into the minds of those who heard the gospel and make their choice for them. He did the best he could. He left it in their hands and he left it in God's hands because God gives the increase. 
But when he found that there were some who would not listen, he didn't quit teaching. That's what the devil wants us to do. You know that, right? When we reach out to a person and that person is unreceptive or we, we try to talk to a person about even setting up a study and they put up a wall, Satan wants, to say, wants us to think, you're wasting your time. There's nobody out there that's interested, so just go to church and leave everybody else alone. That's what he wants us to do. That is a program of failure. And so when Paul was rejected by some, he said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm not quitting. He said, I'm gonna turn and I'm gonna go to the Gentiles. And that he did. And one of the individuals about whom we read here Verse number eight, Crispus, the chief root of the synagogue, believe. We'll talk about him more in a minute. But here, here's a thought on the part of the messenger. You know, there are some individuals that once you learn about their background and their circumstances, we understand that there are some individuals who are more difficult to approach. And there certainly are some individuals who are more difficult to persuade. And on the surface, you would think that the chief ruler of the synagogue, he's going to be one of those chances are not very good. He's going to accept the gospel type people. And here's what we learn about the messenger Paul. He didn't shy away from what might be considered a difficult case. Difficult or not difficult, if a person's outside of Jesus, they're lost and they need the gospel. And so after there had been some conversions, then comes a message from the God of heaven. Look again at verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. So, so God basically said, number one, don't be afraid. And number two, don't hush. And when you read Paul's response to that, his response was he continued to teach the word. And so the messenger we don't idolize Paul, but we respect him and we admire his effort in the city of Corinth. He was God's messenger. What about the message? What message did Paul preach to get those initial conversions in Corinth? Well, on the negative side, first observe this way with me. Paul was not preaching Paul. Perhaps you have observed some people and the way they present a religious message, you get the feeling it's all about that person. And sometimes when they get done speaking, whether you've heard them in person or seen them online or seen them on TV, when they get done, you have no clue what they said because all you remember is the way they conduct themselves. Paul tried to stay out of the way of the cross so people could see the one who gave his life for them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 5, Paul reminded the church in Corinth with these words. He said, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. And so the message that Paul preached in Corinth, trying to persuade them, reason with them, persuade them to cause them to become followers of Jesus, Paul was not preaching Paul. Well, what Paul was preaching, we already read in verse 5, he was testifying or showing that Jesus was the Christ. Now, look in verse number 11. He stayed there for another year and a half teaching what? The Word of God. What would be the difference? What would be the difference in verse 5 that he was preaching that Jesus was the Christ and verse 11 that he was preaching the word of God? And the answer is it was the same message. Now, turn with me if you would. We're coming right back. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians, you see there's a connection. This is a letter that he later wrote to the Christians in Corinth. 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, let's start in verse 1 and I'll read down to verse 4. I think it'll sound really familiar. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and going to verse 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, 
by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory, what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture and that he was seen and he mentioned some of those. Now, according to verse number one, how does Paul describe the message that he originally had preached when he went to the city of Corinth? And in verse number one, he describes it as the gospel. And so in Acts 18, we learn that he declared that Jesus was the Christ. In Acts 18 and verse 11, we learn that he taught the word of God. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1, we read that he preached the gospel. And in another passage, in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, we learn that he said, look, I didn't claim to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, how many different messages did Paul preach when he was there? And the answer is, he preached one message. When he was with the Jews, he would reason from the Old Testament scriptures to declare that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled those scriptures. The word gospel simply means good news. What kind of good news was it? It was good news of salvation through Jesus that God was offering to the people there. Now, why the gospel? Why preach the gospel? Well, that is the means the gospel is the means that God uses to call people. We talked a moment ago about God drawing or pulling or attracting people to Jesus. In 2 Thessalonians 2, in verse number 14, we read that by our gospel, he called you. For by our gospel, he called you unto the glory of our Lord Jesus. I got to get this right. This is the 947th time I've quoted that verse in my life or something like that. And... uh, You happened to be here when I fouled it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know you're going to remember that I messed that up. What I want you to remember is that verse teaches God calls by what? By the gospel. So, So why preach the gospel? Because that's what God uses to call people to Jesus. That's what God uses to save people, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Those who respond by believing and are baptized will be saved. Saved by what? The gospel, Mark 16, 15, and 16. It's by the gospel that God causes people to be born again, being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever, 1 Peter 1, 23. So why did Paul preach the gospel? That's how God called people. That's how God saved people. That's how God caused people to be born into his family. Why do we preach the gospel today? Because that's how God calls people today. That's how God saves people today. That's how God causes people to be born into his family. Mankind does not need something that's similar to the gospel. Mankind doesn't need a message that has some similarities to the gospel. Mankind doesn't need a message that's a gospel mixed with something else. It needs the gospel pure and simple. And you and I have that gospel. And so let us be busy in taking it to others. Now, let's look at the response. How did people respond to the gospel when Paul preached in court? Now, suppose... We were not doing this lesson. But you suppose in in general, we ask this question. When you and I study the book of Acts, what do we learn from all the different cases of preaching? What do we learn about how people responded to the gospel? And I think our general answer will be, well, people responded in different ways. That's certainly what happened in Corinth. Some rejected the gospel. Verse 6, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, to speak against, to speak against the message Paul was preaching. Does that happen today? Yeah, it does. These people were given an opportunity and they rejected that opportunity. Now, if they continued to live 
Was there the potential that they later on could change their minds and go from being rejectors of the gospel to receivers of the gospel? Yeah. A lot of us in this assembly this morning, we didn't grow up in a Christian home, and there was a point in time when somebody reached out to us and we put up a barrier. We were rejectors. And then at some point later on, we became receivers. And so just because somebody initially or the second time or the third time or the 23rd time rejects the gospel, that doesn't mean they'll reject it the 24th time. And so we keep working with people, trying to express the, the, the gospel message in the best way that we can. But some, some rejected the gospel. And, and Paul basically said, look, your, your blood's on your hands, right? You had the opportunity. You rejected it. That's on you. But not everyone rejected it. Some received it. We'll not go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but we read a moment ago in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Paul was reminding the Christians, he said, I preached the gospel unto you and you received it. Now in the book of Acts, receiving the gospel is not simply learning the message, okay? In the book of Acts, when someone received the gospel, they submitted to its message, okay? Those who gladly received the word, Acts 2.41, they were baptized. The people in Samaria, they received the word, they heard it, and, and they were baptized. Now let's, look at, let's look at some specifics. You know, sometimes in the book of Acts, We'll just read a general statement that in a certain place the gospel was preached and, and many believed or many were obedient to the faith and we don't have the names. Well, here in, the, in, in Corinth, we've at least got one name and his name was Crispus. And again, as we've already noticed, he was the chief ruler of the synagogue. Was this in, in our language, in our thinking, was this a big time conversion? Look. Every conversion, if it's a legitimate conversion, every time a person go, any time a person goes from being lost to being saved, that's a big time conversion, right? Because one soul is worth the whole world, more than the whole world. But this is a big time conversion because as the chief ruler of the synagogue, he would have been a man of great influence in the Jewish community. Now, outside of his own clan, outside of his own family, how many others was he able to persuade to join him in obeying the gospel? The Bible doesn't say. But this was a great event. It reminds us of back in chapter 6 and verse 7, speaking about circumstances in Jerusalem where the Bible says a great company of the priest were obedient to the faith. That is, among the, the Jewish people, a number of priests became Christians. What a marvelous thing. Again, people of great influence. And so again, I, I'm pleading with myself just like I'm pleading with you. When we encounter individuals today who seem to be staunch in their religious convictions, people whom we encountered and perhaps in the back of our mind, willing or unwillingly, we're saying to ourselves, there's no point in even talking to this person. They're never going to change. And the answer is when you sow the seed, you just never know. I mean, Paul himself is a perfect example of that one who'd been such a tormentor and persecutor of the church, when he came face to face with the truth, he had an honest and good heart, and he changed. And so if, if I'm out knocking doors and I encounter a person who says, I preach over here at the brand Z denomination, I'm not running to the road to get away from him because his soul is just as precious as anyone else's. And so Crispus, he believed on the Lord. Now, when you study the book of Acts, you will find a number of verses which use that language or similar language. I'm talking specifically about the idea of believing. 
believing on the Lord. That, that word believe in this case is used to include everything that would be required of a lost person to become a saved person. Well, let's take a look at, at a few cases where we see that language. Look in chapter 2, Acts chapter 2. We'll do this quickly. Acts chapter 2, we're familiar with the question that was asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, the answer was to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Did anybody do that? Well, the answer is yes. Look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So, so those individuals that are depicted there in Acts 2 and verse 41, they heard the message, they received it, they were baptized, they became followers of Jesus. How are those people described further down? We'll look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And then verse 44, and all that believed, hit the pause button. Who are these folks that are depicted in Acts 2 and verse 44 as being those, all those who believed? Somebody said, well, I guess they believed in God. That, that's, that's not enough. That's not completely accurate. Because in the context of Acts 2, verse 44, it's talking about those individuals, verse 42, who were continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Verse 41, there are those who had received the word with gladness and been baptized. These are people who've obeyed the gospel. And so in verse 44, when they're simply called those who believed... It's talking about those who have become genuine followers of Jesus, who have complied with that charge to know that Jesus is Lord in Christ, to, be, to repent of their sins, and to be baptized for the remission of sins. Look further in chapter 4. Verse number 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. So someone might, based on those words in verse 4, make the conclusion there's reference made here in this verse to 5,000 believers. In the context, believers are those who have heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. Chapter 5 and verse 14. Chapter 5 and verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. So the language, what kind of people were added to the Lord? Believers. Now hang on a second. Back in chapter 2 and verse 47 we read the historical fact that the Lord on a daily basis was adding a certain kind of person to the church, right? Acts 2.47, what kind of people was the Lord adding to the church? Answer, he was answering those who were saved. So in Acts 5.14, you got people added to the Lord. Acts 2.47, people added to the church, when you're added to the Lord, you're added to the church. When you're added to the church, you're added to the Lord. That's the same thing. So how are they described in verse 47 of chapter 2? They're saved. What did they do to get into the saved category? They heard the gospel, believed it, repented of their sins, and were baptized for the remission of sins. So when you read in Acts 18 and verse 8 that Crispus believed on the Lord, don't put your hand on the hip and do that. Well, not fair. He didn't have to obey anything. He just believed. Well, no. The sense of believing is it's a synecdoche to stand for all that was required for him to become a saved person. Now, just for point of comparison, in Acts 3 and verse 19, we read that Peter said to some individuals, here's what you need to do to have your sins blotted out. Repent and be converted. Okay? Acts 6 and verse 7, those priests were obedient to the faith. Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized. We know this about the God of heaven, right? We know that God is a God of fairness who is impartial and shows no respect to persons. And so whatever those people had to do on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized. It's the same thing that we learn from Acts 3, 19, repent and be converted. Same thing as Acts 6 and verse 7, obedient to the faith. Same thing as Crispus, Acts 18, verse 8, when he believed, he did repent, and he was baptized for remission of sin. Say, preacher, 
If the Bible doesn't say Christmas was baptized, I'm never, ever, ever going to believe it. I don't, I, don't, I don't mind you saying that. Look with me in your Bible at 1 Corinthians 1. You say, well, I don't have time. Now, I do mind you saying that. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, in Corinth, there came a point when there was a divisiveness among the members. They were divided up. Some were saying, I'm of Apollos. Some were saying, I'm of Cephas. I'm of Paul. I'm of the Christ. And in response to that, let's see what Paul writes. Look in verse 13 of chapter 1. Verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. Well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What was the name of those two fellows I read in verse 14 that Paul baptismed? Well, he baptismed Gaius, and what's that other fellow's name? Crispus. So it turns out there is a specific Bible reference to Crispus being baptized. But even if there were not that specific reference, it's clear that as he believed on the Lord that he obeyed the gospel. Now, who else became followers? Well, according to verse number 8 of Acts chapter 18, he believed on the Lord with all his house or his household. So the household of Crispus also believed. Well, who would be involved in those who believed that were part of his household? Well, just like anyone else, it would have to be somebody who's capable of hearing the gospel and understanding. Someone who has the potential to believe. Someone who has the need and the capacity to repent and someone who on a personal level is able to make that choice like the eunuch and say, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? Obviously, no infant, no cracker snatcher or cookie cruncher is in the category of being able to understand, believe, repent, and obey. So no, there were no infants included in that group who were baptized. And then there's a, a specific reference, no names given at the end of verse number eight, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Somebody said, well, I'm, I'm a little confused because I remember that Jesus said when it comes to the path that's going to life, there are few that find it. And many are going the path of destruction. Well, here in, in this case, it says many heard, believed, and were baptized. Well, in, in this specific instance, in this locale, at this point in time, there were many. How many does that constitute? I have no idea, and I'm not going to speculate. In some instances, it may be one, it may be a few, it may be many. You know what I know? Any baptism is special, right? And when you got many folks who are involved, that's just extra special. And again, as you read about the last part of that verse, they heard, they believed, and they were baptized, we're reminded of the reality that God is no respecter of persons. And so what those many folks had to do, that's exactly what Crispus had to do. Whatever Crispus had to do, that's what his household had to do. Thank God that there are people in this world even today who are willing to sit down and reason from the scriptures, learn the truth, believe the truth, and obey the truth. Great things happened in Corinth when Paul preached the gospel and people were receptive. Does that mean that once they became followers of Jesus, they would never have a problem for the rest of their lives? And the answer, of course, is no. Well, what a great start. So we looked at the messenger, the message and the response. What about you this morning? Where do you stand in your relationship with the God of heaven? If Jesus were to come this morning before we dismiss this assembly, would you be happy with the result of his coming if he were to come this hour? 
If you've never obeyed the gospel, do you not believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And are you not ready in repentance to turn from your sins and in your faith, confess that faith and be baptized for remission of sins? Or maybe here's a child of God and you need the prayers of the saints. Brother Bob selected a song. If it's convenient, would you stand as we sing together? and then be dismissed in prayer. 254. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the glory breaks eternal bright and fair when the Savior first shall gather over on the other shore and the bow with me, please. Lord and Father in heaven, we are so thankful and blessed for the many blessings that you have given us, this place to gather, to worship and praise your name in peace, and your Son and his sacrifice on our behalf. Please be with those, Father, that were mentioned that need your help to be healed and come back to gather and praise your name. Please be with the world in this dark time of strife and help open our hearts and minds as we go into our classes to learn more of your gospel. 
Please help bring us back at our next appointed hour. And it is in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you for being part of our class this morning. It's so good to see everyone. We're going to be studying from the sixth chapter of First Timothy. We're going to finish up First Timothy today. That's our plan. Lesson number nine in, in your book. Before we begin, let's go to God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day you've given us. We're thankful, Father, for the time of worship that we've been able to enjoy. We thank you now, Father, for this opportunity to study from your Holy Word. And we pray, dear Father, that that would help us to rightly divide that word of truth. We pray, dear Father, that we can learn and understand the things that you would have us to gain from this chapter in, in your word. And we pray, dear Father, that we can apply the lessons to our lives and help us, Father, to be more what you would have us to be and better able to serve you in your kingdom. Father, be with those that are sick and suffering, particularly those of our number, Steve and Teresa, and those that are confined at home, and Sister Audie and Sister... Billy Salmons and Jimmy and Sister Carol Gass, Father, and we pray you'd be with those and bless them. And Father, we ask your blessings upon those that are in Ukraine, and we pray, dear Father, that you'll bring an end to this war and the suffering on those innocent people. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. You remember in uh, chapter 1, Paul had to go over into Macedonia, and so he left Timothy at the city of Ephesus. And the responsibility that Timothy had was to charge some that they preach no other gospel, that they teach no other gospel. Then in chapter 4 of First Timothy, we saw where that some of the false doctrine that was being promoted was that... Uh, We were men were to refrain, men and women were to refrain from marrying, and then they were commanded not to eat meats. So those were two false doctrines there. Well, today we're going to look at another false doctrine that was being promoted. And in chapter six, if you look at verses one and two, which we studied some last week. It says, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved and partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. the relationship between servants and masters is what he's talking about there. And he says that, that servants are to honor their masters. They are to serve them. And they are to be submissive to their masters. And if your master is a heathen, then you honor him and you serve him so that the name Christian is not blasphemed. Because if you were to be insubordinate, if you to be, were to be rebellious, and you being a Christian, that would bring a bad name or, or bad connotation to the name Christian. And then if you're a, a servant who just is fortunate enough to have a believing master, then that's even better and you, sh you should render even better service to that master. You should count him with honor, and you should look upon your services to him as, I'm benefiting a fellow Christian. He's beloved, and I want to do my best to serve him. And so the ideal here is, is servants to be submissive, subordinate, 
and to honor their masters. That's the teaching from the Apostle Paul. Well, there's some that, that we're going to teach something different from that. And we read in verse 3, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So here's, here's another false doctrine that was going to be promoted. This doctrine would be different from what Paul taught about the relationship between servants and masters. And so if Paul was teaching that you be submissive, that you be subordinate, that you honor, then the teaching that these false teachers were giving would be something different from that. It would be be rebellious, don't submit to your master, don't show them any honor, don't show them any respect. That would be contrary to what Paul has been teaching. And he says that uh, they're not consenting to the words that Paul preached, the gospel that Paul preached, and also these are against the words of our Lord. They're against the words of Jesus. And, and if you think back on Jesus' teaching, you remember when someone showed him a, a coin They'd asked him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And he said, well, whose inscription's on, on the coin? And, and they said, Caesar's. Well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render unto God the things that are God. Jesus respected the authority of government. He respected the authority of government to levy taxes and citizens of that government to be submissive to the government laws. Well, slavery was, was governed by the laws of the Roman Empire. And so when you teach that slaves are not to be uh, submissive, that they're to be rebellious, that they're not to honor and respect their master, you're teaching something totally against the Roman law. Slaves were, were considered property under the Roman law, they had no rights. They had, didn't have the right to own property. They didn't have the right to, to marry. And their masters could, could sell them. They could trade them. They could even put them to death. And so if, a, if, a, if someone's teaching something contrary to what Paul taught, the reason Paul taught that was because if there had been a rebellion of the slaves against their masters because of the Christian religion, you can imagine what that, how that would have harmed the religion of Christ at that point in history. And so he says, if, if they're teaching something other than these wholesome, sound words, the truth, then uh, verse 4 says, he's a proud person. Proud person is one who is, is prideful. And if you're a person who thinks, well, what I, my reasoning is better than God's reasoning. <laughs> you know, if, if the words of the Lord say that you be submissive, well, I think my words are better than the word, words of the Lord. So I'm lifted up with pride. I, I'm just too full of myself. I think what I say is more important than what the Lord had to say. And it says, you're puffed up and you know nothing. You know nothing. If you preached a doctrine that would, that would incite the servants, the slaves, to rebel against their masters, you would destroy, you would, you would hamper the cause of Christ. And you don't know because God is going to work this slavery thing out. In time, the Lord is going to work it out. He's going to change the hearts of men through the gospel so that slavery will disappear. But these men didn't know that. 
They were teaching a doctrine that was different, teaching a doctrine of rebellion, and they had no knowledge about what God's intention was between the relation between servants and masters. He's proud knowing nothing, but doting about questions. Doting about questions. Doting on something is to, to uh, dwell on it. Dwelling on questions and strifes, words, life, railings, evil surmising. is going to lead to envy between masters and, and uh, the servants. The servants are going to envy the prosperity of their masters. Going to lead to strife, going to lead to contention, fussing and fighting uh, among slaves and masters. Railings, vicious words and language, evil surmising. When someone does something, if, if you have this evil surmising you're you're looking at anything that someone does as if their intentions are evil toward you and that would come from from this attitude of well I'm going to rebel against my master everything my master is doing is just to do me harm and uh, surmising that his intentions are evil uh, towards you verse 5 says it's perverse Disputings of men, of corrupt minds. These are people who won't listen. They won't listen to, to the truth. They're destitute of the truth. They don't know the truth. If they knew the truth, they, they're not following it now. And supposing that gain is godliness. Here's the crux of the whole matter. Here's the motive for those that are teaching this false doctrine. They're supposing that they can make personal gain, that they can have a career and employment and they can get rich off of preaching and teaching this false doctrine. They're pretending, they, can't, they come into the church, their motive was to get rich off of their pretension to be a godly person. Their intention is they're going to get rich. They're going to, to have personal gain. And so that's what's motivating them to teach this false doctrine. You know, for any service to God to be acceptable, it has to be based on the right motivation. And these false teachers certainly did not have the right motivation uh, for, for their teaching. What's Timothy supposed to do about these false teachers? He's supposed to withdraw himself from them. He is supposed to have no fellowship, no association with these false teachers there that are, are at, at Ephesus. And then he makes a contrast here in, in verse 6. Contrast with, with the false view. He says, but godliness with contentment is a great gain. Godliness, devotion and service, religious service to God, that's great gain if it's with contentment. And to be contented is to be satisfied with your situation, to be pleased with your situation and not looking to make any changes or make any improvements. You're pleased and happy with your situation. So if, if you can couple godliness, faithfulness, service to God with being content in your situation, that is great gain. That is great gain for these Christians at Ephesus. It's great gain for you and I is to have contentment to go along with our 
godliness, our service to God, our devotion to God. It's great gain. Greatest gain? Heaven. That's the greatest gain. Godliness coupled with contentment. Paul over in, in uh, Philippians talked about how that, that no matter what his condition was, that he was contented. He was contented with his situation. Verse 7. Reason we ought to be contented. We brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Brought nothing into this world. Chapter 1, verse 21, he said, Naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. None of us will be able to take any of our material possessions We made it. We, we have survived. We made it. And when we leave this world, there won't be anything that we have that we have amassed or accumulated in this life. There won't be anything that we'll be able to take, any of those material possessions that we'll be able to take, up, take with us. We brought nothing in. So if, if you can live a life of contentment and be satisfied with, with your situation. That's the best outcome for you rather than, than amassing a lot of this world's goods. Verse 8, he says, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Food and raiment, the necessities of life. That's what he's talking about here. We ought to be satisfied if we have food, if we have raiment, if we have shelter, then that ought to be enough to, to satisfy a man here on earth. We don't need to be piling up earthly possessions. We're not going to take them with us as long as we have food and shelter and raiment then we should be satisfied with that. And he's writing this, he's writing this, this part to those that are not wealthy. He, he's writing this, this instruction to people who are not rich. Bob. In the, in the Amish community yeah. you're talking about? Some of the ones that are pretty strict and, you know, they don't want people driving to make more and more and more. Yeah. Their, their philosophy, that was their philosophy of, of, of life is living just what you need. Well, he says that having food and raiment, being satisfied with this. And then, then he gives a, an instruction here in verse 9 to those that are striving to get riches. He says in verse 9, he says, But they that will be rich, those who set their heart on gaining riches, those who do that fall into temptation 
and a snare. If you set your heart on gaining this world's riches, then you're going to be tempted to do things that are sin sinful in order to acquire those riches. And you're going to find yourself in the snare of the devil. Because in James, he, James wrote about when, when a man is tempted, he's drawn away by his own lust. And then he's enticed. Satan's the enticer. It's into temptation. And then the devil is there with his enticement to snare you in the trap that has been laid for you. And so a man who is, or a woman who is seeking to be rich has their heart set on being rich. They're going to lead themselves. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, lead us not into temptation. If you're just going to be leading yourself various temptations to sin. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Final ruin. If that's your goal in life to, to become rich and you're willing to do whatever it takes to get those riches, you're going to find yourself at, at the end of life in ruin. That's what's happened to you. And then verse 10, this is probably the most familiar verse of all in, in uh, 1 Timothy. It's, For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. The greedy Love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. He doesn't say that the possession of money is evil because we all, everybody here, we have some money. We have money in our billfold. So it's, it's not the possession of money, but it's the love of money that causes the trouble. When you just have this greedy love to want to accumulate more and more and more money. That's what's evil. The accumulation. The greedy love. Which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There are some that had, in their efforts to, to gain money, they loved money, they have departed from the faith. They have left the faith. And I was thinking about, what, do you remember, what motivated Judas to betray the Lord? His greed, greed, his, his love for money. 30 pieces of silver he betrayed the Lord. And what about Ananias and Sapphira? What was there? They lied about the price that they had received for the land that they sold. They, they were greedy. They loved for money. And look, look at their ruin. And so, Bob? Yeah, that they they 
they lied about the amount that they had received because they wanted to keep they wanted to keep some of that money that for themselves. They didn't have to give it all to the Lord, but when they told the apostles that yeah we sold it for this much and and we uh, uh, were giving it all to the Lord, then uh, that's where they get in trouble because they they lied about. It. And greed is one thing. Lying is one of the sins that people will commit in order to, to gain money. And so their, their sin was that they lied uh, to the apostles about the amount of money because they wanted to keep back some of it. And I think, too, like Bob said, they, they probably wanted some of the, uh, I guess, pats on the back from people that they had sold their property and given all their money. They, they wanted people to think highly of them because they had given, they had sold their property and given the money uh, to the apostles. But it says they, they've, they've pierced themselves through with many sorrows and certainly Judas and, and Ananias and Sapphira are examples of being pierced through with many sorrows. But now here's a contrast for Timothy. He says, But thou, O man of God, and a man of God is one who is devoted to the service of God. But thou, O man of God, you flee these things. You flee seeking after riches. You flee the love of money. You flee the motive that's motivating these false teachers where they're wanting to become rich off of teaching a false doctrine. You flee these things. And when you flee, here's the direction that you need to go. You're going away from the love of money and, and riches. You need to go in the direction of righteousness, the direction of godliness, the direction of faith, go in the direction of love, patience, and meekness. All of those are, are characteristics of a faithful Christian. Righteousness is our right dealing with our fellow man. Godliness, our devotion and service to God. Faith Faith is what motivates us to do and love is the motivation of faith that works by love. And then patience and gentleness or meekness. Those are all things that, that a Christian strives for. He says in verse 12, he says, Fight the good fight of faith. The Christian faith is a struggle to maintain the Christian faith is a struggle he said you need to fight that good fight of faith the struggle lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and in our lesson today we know how you're called by the gospel Paul, in several of his epistles, he used this idea of, of Christians are like soldiers. You know, we're, we're, in, we're in a life and death struggle to stay faithful to the teaching of God's Word is a struggle. And, you know, he gave in Ephesians, you know, put on the whole armor of God so that you can defend against the wiles of the devil. Fight the good fight. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life because Timothy laid hold on eternal life by, by doing what God said to do in order to receive eternal life. He says, Whereunto you are called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Most likely this is referring to when Timothy obeyed the gospel there in Acts chapter 14 when Paul and, and uh, Barnabas came through 
Lystra and Timothy obeyed the gospel then and he would have made that confession that he believed that Jesus was the son of God he said in verse 13 he says I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth, quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession I'm giving you a charge I'm giving you a solemn order Timothy and he says I'm giving this to you in, in front of, of God Christ is a witness to this solemn order that I'm giving you he mentions Jesus' confession before Pilate as an example of of, uh, of his when he was standing before Pilate you know, Pilate asked him, are you a king? And uh, he said, I'm a king, but my kingdom's not of this world. He confessed that he was who he said he was. He was the son of God. He was a king. He had a kingdom. And so that confession. Verse 14 says, Thou that keep, that thou, this is his order, that thou keep, this commandment without spot unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ your order is to keep this commandment keep the whole body of teaching of the Christian religion the faith the gospel you keep it you keep it without spot without spot would be without sin no sin would be in his life and unrebukable not doing anything that would be uh, cause for rebuke or for charges of doing wrong you keep yourself free from sin as you keep the commandments of God and you keep yourself from any wrongdoing that could be charged against you and you do that until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ you do that till the end of your life or if Christ comes before the end of your life you keep it as long as you live verse 15 says which in times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate the king of kings and the lord of lords which in his times that tells me that that Paul didn't claim to know when Jesus was coming again. He will come in his time, but Paul didn't know when that time would be. And then he says when he comes, it'll be made known who the absolute ruler is, the King of kings and Lords of lords. Verse 16, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto whom no man has seen nor can see to whom be honor and power everlasting amen God is the self existing one he hath immortality and because he has immortality then we have immortality because we have we, he has given us a spirit an eternal spirit but God is self-existent no man can approach unto whom no man is seen you remember on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to, to uh, Saul of Tarsus what was it when, when he saw a bright light and that light was so bright that he had to fall on his face. He was even blinded. I guess what little light he saw, he was blinded and fell on his face. It's the brightness of the divine glory. No man has seen. Then in verse 17, this earlier part of the chapter is directed to people who were poor, who were seeking to become rich. 
But in verse 17, he's got some instructions to those at Ephesus who were already wealthy. And he says, charge them that are rich in this world that to be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Charge that there were some people at Ephesus that were wealthy and there's instructions for those that, that are wealthy that uh, Paul is, is going to give. This is what Timothy is going to remind those in Ephesus that are wealthy. Not to be high-minded. Sometimes when people have great wealth, they can look upon their wealth and say, I earned all this. It was my hard work. It was my personal achievement, my industriousness. That's why I've got all this wealth. It's the result of my work and my actions. And so I'm entitled to use that any way I want to. If I want to spend it on pleasure, if I want to spend it on obtaining possessions, well, I worked hard for it. I deserve it. That's how I mind it. You don't, you don't recognize that God's the source of everything that you have. Don't be high-minded. Don't trust in uncertain riches. Jesus said that the riches here on earth they're subject to corruption where moth and rust doth corrode, where thieves break in and steal. And when you have great wealth, sometimes you begin to think, well, I'm set. I, I'm, nothing can happen to me that can harm me because I have all this money. I can, I can survive anything. And I think about the the fellow over in Luke chapter 12. Do you remember there was a rich man whose fields brought forth plenty? And Ron, what was it that he thought he was going to do? Yeah, what, what was he going to build? I'm going to build bigger barns where I'll have a place to store my goods. He was going to hoard all that up, hoard all the, the grain that he had, his fields had brought forth. He was going to build bigger barns to hoard it. That's the ideal not to have. That's the attitude not to have. No, not high-minded, trust in riching. You need to trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That's where your trust needs to be not in the uncertain riches. Now here's the instructions of how to use the wealth that you accumulate in this life. Here's what they're to do. They are to do good. That they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. If you're wealthy, this is how you need to use your wealth. Rich in good works. Doing good. Good works like the Bible defines as good work. Not good works that men look at and say, but good works that the Bible defines as good works. Ready to distribute. Ready to give that money to someone who has a need. You're not to hoard that up, hoard your wealth, so that you can have it just for your own personal use. You need to distribute it to those that are in need. You need to be willing to communicate. And we learn in Philippians chapter 4, Paul talked about the church at Philippi, how that no church communicated with him except the church at Philippi. Communicating, meaning to, to provide funds for the preaching and the teaching of the gospel uh, where it hasn't been taught or mission work. Be willing to support the spread of the gospel with the wealth that you have. 
When you do that, when you use your wealth properly, you'll be laying up, verse 19, you'll be laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Laying up store for myself. What was it Jesus said? Lay up your treasure in heaven. That's what he's talking about. When you use your wealth for good works and for distribution to those in need, that's laying up treasure for yourself in heaven. I found this little statement in, in one of the books. I looked. It said, Do not devote your life to gathering treasure that cannot be converted to the currency of the country to where you're going. I thought that was a that was an interesting uh, and a very wise, very wise statement. Do not devote your life to gathering treasure that cannot be converted to the currency of the country to where you're going. We're on this earth temporary. We're headed to a home in heaven. That's our goal, is to reach heaven. So we need to be laying up treasures in this life that'll be worth something when we get to heaven. Lay hold on eternal life. That tells me it's possible for the rich to get to heaven. Doesn't it, you? Yeah. Wealthy, wealth does not have to be something that holds you back from getting to heaven. You use that wealth the way Paul said to use it, then you can lay hold on, on heaven. And then his, here's his final words to Timothy in verses 20 and 21. He says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. What had been committed to Timothy's trust? The gospel. The gospel, the truth of the gospel had been committed to Timothy. Timothy was to see that there were no changes made to the pure gospel these false teachers these false doctrines that were being promoted Timothy was to see that the gospel that he preached was the truth he was to teach it to other men so that they would have the truth pass along the truth the gospel message Timothy, the gospel message is never to be changed. The only one that will change it are false teachers. God will never change. That, that faith was once and delivered to the saints, and God will never change it. But men will seek to change it. Timothy, my charge to you is that you keep that which is committed to you. You keep that body of truth and don't you allow any changes. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Useless talks, no profit. These false teachers that want to, to wrangle and, and to promote their speculations, don't get caught up in that, Timothy. Don't yield to the false teachers. Don't agree with them. And you get on with your responsibility of preaching and teaching the truth. He says there are some that have erred, some members of the church, professing have erred concerning the faith. They've run out after the speculations. You know, the, the, there's never a conflict between the Bible and science. Now, science is always changing. Science is always finding something 
new or creating new theories. But we don't change the Bible to agree with these new theories. The Bible is eternal. The Word is eternal. It's never changing. And eventually science will prove the Bible is right. Everything that the Bible teaches will sh be shown to be true to what science finds out. No conflict ever between the Bible. And then his final word to Timothy is grace be with you. God's favor be with you, Timothy, is his final words. Let's look at our questions and how did Paul describe the message of Jesus? Yeah, wholesome words, sound words, healthy words. Words of false teachers are sick, sick words. God's words are healthy words. What did Paul tell Timothy to do in response to those that rejected the message of Jesus, rejected those wholesome words? What did he tell him to do? Withdraw yourself from them. Have no association, no fellowship. What should godliness be joined with? Godliness with something is great gain. Contentment. Question four. What perils await those who desire to be rich? Yeah. Temptations, snares. What is the root of all kinds of evil? The love of money. <laughs> right, Carla. The love of money. What did Paul tell, tell Timothy to fight? He's supposed to fight something. The good fight of, of faith. The struggle to stay faithful. What was Timothy to command the rich? Not be high-minded. And how was wealth to be used? He gave three areas there. Good works, distribute, and communicate. Thank you so much for your attention. Now next week we're going to start 2 Timothy. And we're going to see a total different tone in Paul as he's writing 2 Timothy. Thank you so much for your attention.